This may take just a couple of seconds to download. It's a very, very large Excel file with almost a, a million rows in it. Cool. Okay. So my name is Tyler Dukes. I'm a reporter with WRAL News in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, I am an investigative reporter who specializes in data and public records. And I am assisted here today by Janae Osterhelp, who's another one of my fellow Neiman Fellows, columnist for the Kansas City Star. So we will be uh, sort of going back and forth between talking a little bit about using data and stories. We're also going to dive in a little bit more deeply into using data practically and how we would go through approaching a new data set that we've never seen before. Um, and as we do that, if you have questions, please raise your hand. Feel free to interrupt me. Um, we, will, we will be working through a couple. It looks like most of you have Macs, but some of you have Windows. That's totally fine. We'll sort of work with it. Um, a couple things we're going to be looking at today. So like I said, data and stories. We're also going to get hands-on on a campaign finance data set. So we're going to look at donations to both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump in the second quarter of 2016. We're going to talk a little bit about the importance of interviewing data and what that means. And as we go through this actual data set that's a real life data set that we use for reporting, you're going to go through the process along with me and then together of sort of generating and trying to answer some of the questions that you're going to pose with this data set. And then we're going to talk a little bit about common pitfalls with data. And the goal here, what I hope you're, you're going to take away, is to learn how to find a story idea in a, due date, in a new data set, even if you know absolutely nothing about it. Now, so how many of you have done campaign finance reporting before? Good, good. So you're going to be an expert in campaign finance reporting by the end. I, I can't actually promise that. But really what I want you to come away with is to never let data scare you off a good story. <laughs> So first off, I want to talk a little bit about a practical example. This is actually one of my favorite um, stories out of the election cycle. And um, it, uh, so let's look at that real quick. This is a New York Times. Um, this was, a, I think, a three or two or three person team that looked at who was donating money during the, uh, the 2016 campaign. And this story was actually written in 2015, so they were looking at especially early on, where is the money coming from? And in addition to having a really nice little visualization here about sort of what, uh, who actually donates money, one of the things they found was that a vast amount of money was coming from a very small subset of families in the United States. And this is essentially a big long story where they break this down by industry and you can see the enormous houses that these people have. Uh, you can uh, look at some really beautiful aerial photos of these really rich neighborhoods, which for some reason don't seem to be showing up. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to call your attention to is most of this is not about data. There's a very, very specific piece in this uh, in, in a couple sentences. And this is what those two paragraphs say. The 158 families that they're talking about in the story each contributed $250,000 or more in the campaign through June 30th, according to the most recent available Federal Election Commission filings and other data, while an additional 200 families gave more than 100000 Together, the two groups contributed well over half the money in the presidential elections, the vast majority of it supporting Republicans. So that's a finding. It's not terribly, I mean, it's interesting, but it's not a story yet, right? It's a story idea. So this is what data journalism is really all about. It's about using data to find the kernel of a story, a story idea, which you then go and explore the why with. And this whole story, even though it's sort of centered on this one specific finding, is going and talking to these families about why they're, they're donating so much of their wealth it's talking to uh, political scientists about what the impacts are when you have this, all of this donations, all these donations sort of consolidated in a very small location. And in fact, I think three of these families actually live in the same neighborhood in Florida. 
Um, and they're really trying to flesh out the why of the story. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today, and specifically how you go about um, fleshing out some of these answers. And so let me get back to my presentation here. So generally when I'm uh, approaching a story, I'm coming at it from two different, maybe one of two different directions. So either I've got a very discreet question, and you can imagine with this story, the super family story in the New York Times, they started with this question of how many families are, you know, sort of among the top donors, and is that a small enough number to make a worthy story out of? So maybe they asked a discreet question, and we're trying to find a data set that can help us answer that. The second approach is to actually generate questions through data exploration. That's what we're going to do a little bit more today. And really what that means is we got this new data set. For example, last night the, uh, the Trump campaign or the Trump administration released a bunch of financial disclosures for some of their top advisors, right? That's a brand new data set. And the reporters last night, and you saw Maggie Haberman literally running out of the building to cover the story. The reporters last night were focused on trying to generate interesting questions to answer through data exploration. So let's go back to this link real quick. If you haven't already downloaded, who has successfully downloaded this data set? Okay, a couple people. So let's take just a couple minutes to do that. Do you know how to connect to a phone? Yeah, so it should be Harvard Guest. Um, and if you, would you mind, and if you're having trouble, let me know. Yeah, there should be, it, it's Harvard Guest doesn't require a password, but you may have to go and, let's see what it's saying. Oh, you have to type in Harvard. Okay. Okay, so they're saying you have to go into the Harvard. You have to go and navigate to Harvard.edu first and agree to the terms of service, okay? Let me get yeah, I got her. Just be like, Okay. So who else is having trouble? Anybody else? We all good? If you are, just raise your hand. We'll come around and, and try to address whatever it is you need. Um, okay, so this is data that is from a site called the National Institutes of... Um, Actually, this is from followthemoney.org, which tracks uh, campaign spending for state-level politicians as well as all the way up through federal. And so I did a little bit of cleanup to this data, so I reduced the size of, I, I cut out a couple of columns. But what you see is essentially some really nice, clean data that a nonprofit provides to us so we can actually analyze it and take a look at it. And so what I want you to do in the next couple minutes is just sort of explore it. I want you to take a look, and we're, gonna, we're sort of going to go through this together, but I want you to go through and try to look and see what you can find out. Take a look at the, the field names, and take a look at some of the, what this data is actually telling you, what it's tracking, what the time period is. And as we go through this, and we're going to go through some more formal steps here in a second, but I want you to start thinking about questions. And these could be questions like, how many people from my city donated to Hillary Clinton? How many, of these pe how many people from my state donated to Donald Trump? What's the comparison? What's the breakdown, right? We see some really interesting um, columns in here, like employer, occupation. So we can ask questions like, how many physicians donated? How many teachers? How many people put specifically from Harvard donated? Or maybe from your university? That will likely be in this data set. So one of the things I want you to notice too, when we start to look at this, is that who, who here is really familiar with Excel? <coughs> Coffee. Great, this is great. So Excel for me is probably one of the things I work with most often as a data journalist. And I think a lot of people who are doing this kind of work are 
mostly working in Excel with the addition of some other uh, other tools. But it's it's really it really is a power tool. It's got some limitations. So one thing I would suggest to you, this is a good place to start this session today, but it will be there'll be a lot more to learn. And so I'm going to teach you a couple tip, tips and tricks for sort of going about cleaning up this data set and making it really easy to analyze. But I want to notice I want you all to notice a couple of things. First off we've got We've got a header row over here that defines all of our fields. We've got our columns. We've also got two tabs here, Clinton and Trump. And when I downloaded this data, what you're going to get is data for specific candidates. right? And what we're going to want to do in a couple minutes is combine this information. But for now, it's in separate sheets. So one of the first things I do when I get a new data set is I just try to make sure I can actually read it. So right now, this, this is, I'm just looking at Clinton here, uh, 459,540 rows, right? So I know I've got a pretty big data set, but I want to make sure that I can sort of navigate through here and understand where I'm at. So one of the things I'm going to do is freeze the top row. That's pretty simple. You can do that one of two ways. If you go into view, there's actually this freeze top row button. Everybody sees that. Your screen may look slightly different if you've got a different version of Excel, so if you can't find it, please let us know. We'll fly, flag one of us down, we'll come and look at it. So, very simple step, but it makes it really easy to see, for example, the difference between contributor, employer, even if I'm down on like the, you know, 1,000th row. Okay, so we've got... So another thing I'm going to look at, I'm going to do that with Trump too, just so I can get this set up. So I want to actually combine these two things, these two sheets, before I go through the process of doing any kind of analysis. Because if we're really talking about doing data journalism, what people mostly care about is the comparison. Right? There's certainly some questions we can answer just by looking at the Clinton data set, just by looking at the Trump data set. But this is going to give us sort of a good, uh, a good way to, to look at them both at the same time. So <coughs> What I need, though, is a way to separate these two, because obviously if I just copy and paste everything into one sheet, I'm not going to know who's Clinton and who's Trump. So there's a very easy way to do that. If we click on the A here, that first column, you'll see that whole first column is highlighted. And if you're on a Mac, control click or two button click or right click if you're on Windows, we're just going to insert a column. We're going to call that column candidate. And we're going to type in, in this case, we're in the Clinton tab, so we're going to type Clinton. Now, like I said, there's 459,540 rows here. So the easiest way to get this information, I, and what I want is that Clinton um, field filled in for every single one of these. So what you're going to see in this cell is this little green box in the corner. And you'll notice when you hover your cursor over it, that cursor turns into a black cross. Double click on that, and we have extended, we filled down, and made every single one of these rows Clinton. Everybody with me so far? <coughs> All right, so we're going to do the same thing to Trump. Okay? So we click on our A column, insert a new column, call it candidate, and we're going to say Trump, not Trump. And again, we're going to hover over that bottom right corner and fill down. Okay. So if you want to navigate through a really, really large data set, um, one easy way to do it is to sort of jump from, from field to field. And you can do that on Max. It's uh, Command Arrow. So, for example, if I'm in the A2 column up here in the left-hand corner, if I do Command Down, I can jump to the very bottom. I can jump back up to the top. If you're on Windows, I believe it'll be Control. Somebody can verify that for me. You can do the same thing, jumping around the column with the the left and right arrows. And this is just really a really good way, really good shortcut to know because you can pop around your data set very quickly. But really what we want to do is just copy and paste all this stuff, right? We want to make sure that we, we get everything, all the data in one place. So we're going to start by coming over to the Trump, uh, the top Trump cell. That's A2, so you see that highlighted there. 
and we're going to do Command Shift right arrow. And we're going to hit that a couple times until we pop all the way over to the amount. So what Command Shift does, Command still pops you, jumps you around the sheet, and then Shift is just going to hold your highlight. Okay. So we should have something that looks like this. Now if we hold down Command Shift again and just hit the down arrow, we're going to capture all of our data at once. We're highlighting everything, all 300,000 plus rows. Everybody got that? So now we're going to copy this. We can either do this by just going up to edit and hitting copy or doing command C. We're going to navigate over to our Clinton tab. And we know it's the Clinton tab because it says it on the bottom when we see the candidate change. We're going to jump down to our bottom row where we see those, where we start to see those blanks. Okay? And then we're just going to paste. And magically all our data is there. Okay, everybody with me? Okay, that was the boring part. All right. Um, one of the things that I want you to do for the next couple minutes is play with sorts and filters. If you're looking at my screen here, and yours may look slightly different, but you probably have a home tab. I think the new version of Excel, all, uh, both Windows and Mac, have this little ribbon. And so you can see this here. So for the home tab, it's truncated on my screen, but you're going to see something that looks kind of like this, sort and filter. Okay. If we press that button and hit the filter button here, then it gives us all kinds of really nice options. And you're going to see these down arrows. So for example, if we maybe we just want to see um, one of your universities. Where are you from? Northeastern University. Northeastern. Okay, let's look at Northeastern. So here's, we go to Employer, and now we can look for Northeastern. And this may be, may bring up a bunch of different things. Here's Northeastern University. Also Girl Scouts of Northeastern USA or something. We're going to go, we can uncheck that one, and we can see literally just Northeast, it might take a second, uh, we can see just Northeastern University. So this, in this way, we can very quickly go through and see we filtered all of the data. This is, again, this is a, almost a million rows of data. And we can see very quickly where this stuff is. So we're seeing some students. We're seeing some teaching assistants. And if we wanted to see who donated the most, we can just come over to the amount column, click on that little down arrow, and hit descending. And then, again, we're going to sort. 1 million rows, and we're going to start to see who donated the most money. So um, Eileen McDonough, has anybody had her as a professor? Okay. Well, she donated $2,700 to Clinton. So that might be interesting. Maybe not. So you can apply these filters. And by the way, if you want to go back to, to um, reset your filter, you can come back up to that button and just hit the clear button and you go back to where we were, okay? Which is really important because you don't want to make sure you're getting lost in the data. So I want to take, um, let's see. Let's take uh, about five minutes here, and I want you to just work through some sorts and filters. And I want you to talk to each other, and I want you to ask some questions, okay? And just see what you find. You can't break it, I promise. Yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you go to do it. Uh, yes, you have it. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, so if you, if the dragging it down is another way to do it, yeah. but it's only, you don't want to drag it all the way down. Yeah. So if you drag it down, you might have to do it. Yeah. I mean, you can, actually, let's just scroll down to that. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, let me just make sure you have all your data. So let's let's start with these two. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So if you just click on the row, it's the okay. And then command shift. Right. Right. And you might do that. Um, but the easiest way, honestly, the easiest way is to get to the So let's start here with the A2. Then you didn't get on board. Okay, so command works. And now on the it's like a so well, no, no, it's fine. So this is this is what kind of Excel you know does to you. Is if you're in a if you're in a column where there's some blank spaces, it'll jump to the next like build in there. So um so the easiest way to do it for you. This guy was really going for it. And, yeah, and that tells Excel that this is $10,000. Oh, okay. Now we go back to one of my last names. <laughs> 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 so I don't need this is a big data set, so it may take a second. <laughs> so, <laughs> so don't, don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> sort of so how do you go down to the move out of Yeah, all the different states, and you can search them. So you don't have to go through. Command One head to the end. In the second and then you can search on your um, sort and filter, which is Oh, yeah, yeah, you have it up here. It's right there. This is the filter. Yeah, it looks like a little Anybody else yeah. stuck? Yes. Sorry about that. This is yours. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what is it? Okay. There's some significant. had a lot of them Okay, so that's all her. Okay. Okay, so let's put your cursor and just click on her. And take the manager. So hers is a good thing right now, and I actually just had to do it. Oh, and that's the airport, too. You just got to go to the airport. Oh, okay, good there. So, um... I think she's right here. I want to figure out how to do it. Where am I going to go? She didn't need to do it. 
and also it was like a so now the header was for the now <laughs> we hit the filter button. Does it see there's just hit the logical drop down? Can you imagine getting this wrong? Right. So the search is done. Um, that would be in one layer. So we can click on the same drop down. Okay. All right. Any any questions? Anybody stuck? I have one really minor question. Yes. How do I freeze the top row? Let's look at yours because some people have this slightly older version. Yeah, I think it's gonna have. Yeah, so to do that, let's go. Isn't that not good to put out there? I mean, it doesn't really work. So, let's do this version. So, <clears throat> just real quickly, for those of you who have, there is a version of Excel where they decided to um, uh, change the freeze pane process. Uh, so, in case you have a slightly older version of Excel and your screen does not look like mine, and your top row is not frozen, you can freeze that top row by clicking the second row here, going to window, and clicking freeze panes. Okay, so if you've already got this done, you don't have to do that. But just in case you, because I know a couple people were having some trouble with that. It's always fun when you're switching back and forth to different versions. Okay. All right, so now, um, so that's the, that's the basic stuff. Uh, but now what I really want to do is jump into the stuff that's really, really fun. Okay, this is the stuff that it's, it's, my favorite part of Excel, and it's, it's a tool called Pivot Tables. So if you are, and how many of you have worked with Pivot Tables? Okay, we got one. So you can help me out here. If you've got any cool Pivot Table tricks, just yell them out. Um, so if we are clicked into anywhere in our sheet, we're in our, our tab with all of our data, this will look slightly different, so bear with me depending on where you are, but probably you will have something like an Insert button here and there'll be an option called pivot table. Okay, if you click that, it'll say select a table or range. And Excel is smart, or it thinks it's smart, so it's going to give you this, um, this table or range here that is, uh, that looks right, actually. Let me make sure this does look right. Okay. So let me go through that again. So it's going to auto-inject all of that stuff in there, so you actually don't have to change anything, and you just hit OK. And what you're going to get is a screen that looks like this, OK? And I'm going to show you why this is super exciting in just a second, but I want to make sure everybody's seeing this screen. So who's not seeing this screen? OK, so let's take a look at your actual OK, so just click into yeah, just press OK. Yeah, I think I'm the same thing. Am I taking it? No, like, I Google it. Okay. All right. So let's see, where is it? It's in data. Yeah, so if you go back to it. And then for some versions of this, it's in the data tab. So if you have a slightly older version, um, you may find it in the data tab. I heard an aha. That's a good sign. Okay, so here's what I love about pivot tables. Pivot tables allows you to really quickly uh, build what are essentially data queries. So if we want to cross-tabulate the data and try to figure out different relationships between the different fields in our data, pivot tables very easily allows us to do that. And it very easily allows us to do that by presenting us with this pivot table builder, which is essentially a drag and drop interface. So here's how this works. When these filings come out, immediately your editor wants to know one thing. Who's on top? That's the most basic question, the most boring question that we have to answer when these quarter-by-quarter quarter filings come up. 
We're going to answer that in two seconds. You'll see right here, we've got a bunch of field names, right? And we see that field that we added candidate is right there, okay? So we can drag that into the rows box here. And I've already done that, so, and you'll see it pop up there. These four boxes are going to tell pivot tables how you want to build this thing. So we're going to start by making our rows candidates. And so we can see Clinton and Trump over there. Not terribly fancy, but we're getting started. So if we scroll down to our field names and find what we really care about, which was amount, and we drag that, and we drop the values, what we see instantly, and just to make it explicit, we can do that. We can see just how far ahead Clinton was in fundraising in the second quarter of 2016 over Trump. $47 million she raised compared to Trump's $9 million. We didn't have to write an Excel formula. We didn't have to um, count by hand. We didn't have to do any kind of other complicated stuff that would take us too long. Okay? But the beautiful thing, this is you know simple and boring and fine, right? We could have done this in, in our other, uh, our other uh, screen, not, not too terribly hard. But maybe what we actually want to know is something like, the state by state breakdown. So we can take the state and we can pull it down to rows. And if we put it underneath the candidate, what we'll, what we'll then get is something like this. We can start to see the breakdown state by state of who donated to Clinton and who donated to Trump. And just like with our sorts and filters before, we can take this information and sort it, and we can find that surprise. Surprise! California was the top, the, was the top state that donated to Clinton, and also Trump. And we also see Texas there, and we see New York in the Clinton camp. So the beautiful thing about this is that we can use pivot table to build this stuff on the fly. And it takes seconds. So we can, for example, um, take a, a look by occupation, which is, I think, a little bit broader than um, employer. And so let me get my computer to struggle with that for just a second. If we drag and drop a state outside of here, it's going to trash it. And then we can start to see a couple things, too. This is some weird looking data, right? We've got fourth grade teacher, fourth grade math teacher. OK, that's a little strange. So maybe we can't compare those two things. We've also got some blank spots. We've got a weird number in here for some reason. We've got this thing that says downsize for some strange reason as well. And we can start to sort of parse through this information in very interesting ways. And I'm going to show you one other thing and then sort of set you loose on this so you can kind of play with it. But, you know, essentially here, Excel, when we drag that amount into the values column there, it's going to assume that we want to sum it, right? But maybe what we actually want to do is get the count. So we want to see how many, what number of donations did each candidate get. So we can go in and click this little I right next to it. You can also right click on it and go to field settings. And you'll see a couple different summaries, right? We can say sum or count or average. So maybe we want count. And we can see in that case, Clinton is also ahead. And maybe we want to look at these things side to side. So we can actually bring a mount there again. So we get our sum. And then maybe we want to bring another amount down there. And we want to change that to average. And then we start to see something interesting. Trump's average donation is higher. Why is that? Now, that's not, we're not going to be able to answer that question with the data. It's going to be up to us to go out and try to figure out why is it that Donald Trump is getting higher average donations than Clinton? Is it because Clinton is leading in small donations or is something else happening? we can really start to parse through some questions we want to answer and some interesting story ideas that we can pose. 
So take just a couple of minutes here, knowing what you know, since you're all now Excel and pivot table masters. I want you to play around with this. There's, there's other things you can do too, like we can, you can even try pulling this stuff into the columns. Um, if you pull it into the columns uh, box here, it's going to divide it all up so you, compare, you can compare Massachusetts to Massachusetts and Florida to Florida. So you can look at this data in all kinds of different ways. So while you're, while you're doing this, while you're spending the next five, ten minutes just kind of playing with this stuff, I want you to think about and jot down some questions that you want to answer. You may not know how to answer them yet, but I want you to think about what kinds of questions might we answer with this data. What kinds of interesting trends might we surface and, and think about how we might be able to solve them. And what we're going to do is we're going to use pivot tables and some other stuff in, in Excel in the last part to actually answer these questions as best we can with the data set. And if you have questions, please let me know and feel free to talk amongst yourself. Selves. Yes. Quick one. You yeah. added like count amount, sum amount, average amount. Mm -hmm. How did you like when I change it to count of, it takes away my average of. When you change it, so show me what you're. Okay, I'll come yeah. to you. So like, I have average amount right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I add sum of. This is one. Yeah. That's okay. okay. Yes. Um, so we want to drag yeah. another. So if you, uh, you just drag uh, another yeah. instance Ooh, of that. Oh, okay. And then you can change that one. It'll, it'll still default to some, but you can right. change it. Too. So. Yeah, so if you want to sort the column, um, basically what we can do is, and I'll show you how to do it on my screen, so it might be a little bit easier. So if you want to sort the columns, this pivot table builder will probably be in the way. But if we just click on the home tab, just like we did before here, actually, I'm going to make this a lot simpler because this is kind of nasty. So if we wanted to just sum, let's say, um, we've got the state. We can turn that filter filter on. And we can say sm largest to smallest. Yeah. You just kind of have to move, especially on my screen, because I'm presenting. It's a little smaller. You could, but I would probably do it just by filtering here. So, um, so is this your main tool? Just, just do one quick thing for me. If you click on, let's go to the view there. Not this one. Right, click on A2. I just want to read your code just so you can see which is a good Just make sure you're Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
so you can do it. You can kind of use that simple to get everything. Now you can also do it in pivot tables. So if you wanted to see like the count of the number of people who donated to one session a hundred or more, because maybe you wanted to figure out why that was taking place. It's probably an, an anomaly. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we are almost at the end of this marathon data dive session where you're all now experts in both campaign finance and in Excel. What I want is for you guys to raise your hands and just give me a couple of questions that you would like to answer using this data set. What interests you about this data? And what would you like to find out that you might not know how to find out yet? Yes. And, and can you introduce yourself to and tell me where you're from? Yeah. Hi, I'm Sarah from Harvard. Um, and I'd be interested in looking at the relationship between occupation type and um, political affiliation and like the amount to see like what the average amount would be. OK. So would you be interested in, um, so just to flesh that out, are we interested in like the average amount a Republican donates versus the average amount a Democrat donates? Is that kind of what yes. you'd be interested in? And okay. specifically within each occupation. Within, within each occupation, yeah. okay, okay. Uh, let's see, um, all right, uh, who else? Yes. Uh, one would just be- And who are you, where are you from? I'm Stefan, I'll go to UMass Amherst. Okay. One would just be who the, which individuals contributed the most to each candidate. 
and another would be uh, what job position donated the highest, oh, well, I guess what job position would donate the highest average amount and what job position uh, uh, donated the most times, so. Most times, so the count. Yeah, so like which job position is like donates most. Okay, all right, who else? Yes. Hi, I'm Michael Sullivan, Boston College. Um, I was interested in finding out the average number, uh, the average amount by state, um, and seeing if that ended up being a state that went red or blue. So mm, my, okay. gu my guess is just that states that ended up on average donating less per person probably had fewer voters. Okay, so that's kind of your hypothesis, and yeah. you're, you're looking to maybe prove or disprove that. Okay, who else? Yes. Um, we're interested in. Oh, I'm Jessica, and I'm from Bowdoin College. We're interested in like to whom and how much government employees donated. That's a good one. Okay. And then maybe let's do like one more. Yes. Um, my name is Ash Zuganish, and I'm from Pitt News. And my question was, what like news cycle events spark um, like people to donate? Ah, uh, smart people are doing it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we have about 15 minutes left. I want to take the next 10 to answer as many of these tough questions as we can. Not all of them we're going to be able to do. But let's start with the first one. This was Sarah's question. Okay, the relationship between occupation type and political uh, affiliation to see maybe the average amount. Okay, so we got a couple things there in that question that we can think about, right? So we've got a field that defines, what's our field there? Are we interested in occupation or are we interested in employer? Maybe occupation. Probably occupation, right? There's, that's probably something we'd be most interested in. Um, and we can do a quick thing. One of the things I like to do just to see what my data look like is to sort of Take a closer look at if my uh, laptop won't freeze. So we saw again that this data is a little dirty, right? So here's our. I just clicked on the filter button in that in that column, and we see some weird stuff here, right? Some stuff that doesn't always jive. Like you know, somebody put their their um, employer as dash, right? So that's something we want to be aware of, because when we do our analysis, our analysis may be missing some things. So maybe we have to do something like when we go through and clean the data, we're going to we're only going to rule out, uh, we're only going to use um, certain occupations. So maybe we limit that to something like teachers or architects or something like that. So that's one way we might go about answering this question. What um, what are some other things in that baked into that question that we feel like we might need to know? What don't we have in this data set? Artisan. Partisanship, political affiliation, right? Because if your question was political affiliation and not who did they donate to, mm -hmm. right? We need to know whether they're Democrat or Republican. And there may be, per your question, something really interesting in Democrats that voted for Republicans. Mm -hmm. Can we get that data? You said yes. Where would we get that data? I mean, people register with their selected parties often, so you'd have to uh, go through government. Sources. We do. Um, how many of you are registered to vote? I should see every damn hand up. <laughs> okay, I don't have internet right now for whatever reason. But um, if you go on the North Carolina voter registration page right now, you can look me up and you can look up my affiliations. And if you ask the uh, Board of Elections in any state for the entire voter file, you will get it. Millions of people in your state are registered to vote with the state, and that is a public record. And you could, if you were so inclined. Now, it doesn't tell you how to vote, how they vote. It just tells you where they're, what they're currently registered as. So I'm registered independent. So you won't see how I voted. But you'll see when I voted. You'll see what precinct I'm in. So you can sort of think about a scenario where, well, maybe we can match on something like contributor name. Like maybe we can put those two data sets together. And in fact, that's what some of the best data journalism actually does, is take two data sets and sort of mashes them up. Now, we're going to have some issues with people like John Smith, 
and we have to figure out how we might solve that. And that's one of the reasons why working with campaign finance data, data can be really tricky. Um, but it's an interesting question that we can already think about. Like maybe there are some ways that we can probe and answer this question and sort of see average amount. We can certainly see um, things like if we just wanted to say instead of political affiliation, we wanted to see um, uh, who donated to who. We could do something like occupation and pull that below candidate, and we can change count to average. Okay, And then it will calculate that average for us. And then we can start to do things like... Um, sort that, largest to smallest, my, my poor laptop is just struggle busing it here. Um, okay, so, all right, so our average amount managing members, okay, I don't know what that is, probably something like people on boards of companies, restaurant management, geophysical, assisted living, that's kind of interesting. Uh, we see architectural designers, oil investments. Um, and you have to, this is a little difficult sometimes, right? And by the way, if we wanted to jump down to Clinton, we can actually just um, right click on this and, and um, collapse it here. It'll it's working, working, working. Okay, philanthropic consulting for Clinton. Surprise, right? Is anybody shocked, shocked and amazed? Um, we've got chief of staff for OPPT. I don't know what that is. Mayor's chief of staff. Apparently, lots of lots of chiefs of staff of mayor's offices really love. Uh, lots of activists and philanthropists. Actor director. Who's surprised by that? Actor writer producer. They got three things on the name. So we can also we can already start to see that we can draw some conclusions here. We can test some hypotheses here, but it can get a little bit difficult, right? Because we've got. Um, We've got some messy data. So we need to think through that. Because again, this is part of our interviewing process, right? We can't just say, well, the data is what the data is. Because there's some issues here that we need to solve. And maybe we can solve them, maybe we can't. It's tough, though, I'll tell you. Believe me. Um, so which individuals contributed the most to each candidate? That's something we can probably do, right? Uh, and we can actually do that. We probably don't even need a pivot table. We can say, we can pop over to our Trump <coughs> spreadsheet, and we can filter on amount and candidate. And in fact, here's another thing we can do since my, um, my machine is really, really having issues with me. Well, we, we want an average amount, right? Was that what somebody said? Or was that highest amount contributed the most? Okay. So let's do this. Let's, instead of average of amount, let's click on max and hit OK. And one of the nice things about pivot tables is that um, you can see the source of the data. So we just went and said, OK, max amount. Pardon me, let me start over so you can see this because I went too fast. Um, so we see the maximum amount for Trump is $10,800. Now, what's the maximum amount of money you can donate to a candidate? You might know. $2,700. $2,700. Okay, so mm, something's weird there. Um, doesn't mean there's anything untoward happening. Could be that there was $10,000 in in-kind donations and there was some refund or something. Right? Lots of reasons why that or not. Because even Clinton here, we've got um, 30, somebody had $7,300. But if we double click on this number, either the um, 10800 or the 7300 Pivot Tables is going to generate a filtered, specialized spreadsheet that pops up. You see the sheet three here. This is everybody who... Oh, it didn't work for Max, sorry. I forget I said that. But we can see here on Trump, we can very quickly come back into our master spreadsheet and divide or, or essentially sort by that amount, and we can see those big spenders. So here we are, right here. We've got two people, Ray Hugh and Eugene Stark. So we might want to figure out what their deal is, because chances are 
I wonder if I do this. Let's look and see if we can find Mr. Stark. So this might be his only donation in this quarter, but it's possible that he got refunds for something else. Um, and that, that happens. There's a bookkeeping error or something happens or somebody put the wrong number in. Um, so that happens from time to time. Let's see if we can do one more really quickly. So which, what job position donated the highest amount? Um, we can kind of figure out how to do that with pivot tables, right? We can think about dividing everything into employer. Um, average amount by state, and did that end up, uh, did that state end up going red and blue? That's something we can do, and we can do that in pivot tables by pulling our state out. and doing our, do we ask for average or do we ask for total? Average amount. So we can change our sum to average. Please cooperate. Now what do we, th there's a second part of that question that's really crucial. Okay, so we've got something, we've got like, you know, here's Alaska, for example. Uh, average amount, $61. We can also, we'll need to go in here and sort that. So let's sort that largest to smallest. Um, and we can focus on, let's say, let's focus on Trump. Um, here's Alaska, $300 uh, for Trump. We're going to sort that again. Virgin Islands. That's kind of interesting. Uh, Virgin Islands are $530. Okay. Um, so we can actually go in and see all the people who were in Virgin Islands. So what, what's the data point that we don't have here? Whether that state went red or blue. Red or blue, right? Okay. But that's pretty easy to get, right? You get a list of all the states and how they voted, and mash that up pretty, pretty easily. We can start to envision a data set that we can create to sort of answer those questions. So this is the process. It's really just a probing process where we come up with questions and we try to figure out answers. And we think about, in the context of these plain language human questions, what's the data we need, and how do we get it, and whether we trust it. So I just want to um, end very quickly with a couple of points. Um, another reminder that this is the first step in the process, right? Um, the worst data stories, and I know because I've written some like these, are the ones where you sit in front of a computer and a spreadsheet, and you write up a story and you don't talk to anybody, right? Remember that New York Times story. It came alive because you talk, they talked to people. They talked to the families to get a sense of why they were donating hundreds of thousands of dollars collectively to these candidates. And it made a really, really interesting and compelling story. So this is the first step. And the next steps, by the way, are the stuff you all know how to do, right? This is just traditional boots on the ground data uh, journalism, right? So we're all really good at that, right? We can do it. Another thing to remember, and we talked about this a little bit, is that data has its limits. And I love this quote from Meredith Broussard. She's a um, a professor, I believe actually she's at Columbia now, uh, but she wrote a piece for The Atlantic trying to take textbook data and figure out whether or not um, it had any bearing on uh, whether or not uh, per the school performed well or not. And what she found is there's all this data that's being collected and it was all terrible. It was wrong. And she had to do reporting in order to get this and, and to get to this, this understanding. And what she said is that we tend to think of data as immutable truth. But we forget that data and data collection systems are created by people. When people file and report to the Federal Elections Commission what they donated, some of them fill out forms by hand, some of them fill out this stuff electronically. You can see things like there's no standard way to enter in fourth grade teacher or just teacher. You saw fourth grade math teacher and then third grade teacher. So you can start to, th if you think through the data collection process, you can really start to think about what are the problems that can pop up. And sometimes you really have to talk to the experts. You have to talk to the people at the FEC or people who work with this data a lot. Like, where are the pitfalls? Where can I screw up? Because what you want to do is try to find these problems and anticipate them before you publish during that bulletproofing process. So where to go from here? Um, I like these tips from uh, Matt Waite. He's a University uh, of Nebraska Lincoln professor. 
And he wrote this really cool blog post about um, after going to one of these big data journalism conferences and your head's sort of swimming with all these ideas, uh, where do you go from here? Okay, big, big huge takeaway is to find a very specific story or project. Well, there's tons of data out there on your state level. There's tons of data out there probably on your school, even if you're a private school. Find a really specific story or project you want to work with. In this case, we're talking, we talk a lot about Excel. Maybe you want to do something cool with pivot tables. Pick that one thing. Your first project might suck. That's okay. That's how we learn. But don't quit until it's done. And I want you all to remember that you are not alone. Um, I didn't know any of this about five years ago. I, I, I was not an expert in data journalism, and it really took a while for me to pick up these skills. And I did it through a couple of different ways, and a lot of it was on the job, but I, do, I did want to offer a couple resources. First off, um, who's heard of an organization called Investigative Reporters and Editors? Okay, if you've got $25, I highly recommend that you become a part of this organization. I've been a part of a lot of professional journalism organizations. Never have I found one as useful as this one. Um, it's uh, irie.org. Uh, like I said, $25 for students. There's, there's thousands and thousands of what are called tip sheets that journalists produce um, on how to cover stuff, whether it's data or environment or health or higher education that you can search and access. Um, and there are also some really great listservs, including the uh, National Institute for Computer Assisted Reporting listserv, which uh, you can basically submit a bunch of, you know, any question that you have on any project you're working on, and chances are somebody will get to you, get back to you within five or ten minutes. It could be me. Um, but they're interested in helping you solve problems. People from the New York Times, Washington Post, Tampa Bay Times, your local paper probably a member of this. Another thing I wanted to talk about too is this project that I'm doing called Computer Assisted Reporting Study Hall. Um, it's in very early stages right now, but you can see the link there to sign up. Basically what I'm trying to do is create an, uh, an online system for uh, independent study and computational journalism. Um, that's a very broad subject, but we do all kinds of different things like weekly data challenges, we post tutorials, we have discussions about data, walk people through different projects, and we're setting up a mentorship program as well. So that's the um, URL to sign up for that. It's just bit.ly slash car study hall. Very easy to remember. Also, please contact me. I love talking about this stuff. As you can see, how, it's, how animated I am is not just the coffee. Um, this, is, this, is really, uh, this is really fun stuff. And I love seeing new work. And I love seeing other people get excited about it. And I will answer your question any time of the day or night. Just email me or shoot me a note on Twitter. Um, Thank you so much. I know we're running out to where we are now out of time, so I want to make sure you guys can go get some more coffee. But thank you so much for this whirlwind session. Congratulations. You are all dating.